Hey there, everybody. This is Robert Budd, and you are listening to The Robert Budd Show. Show, like super high output. So in today's episode, we are interviewing, I am interviewing, Albert Galore. And Albert is a really good friend of mine I've known for a few years. And in this podcast, like all the other podcasts that I do, I dug in to Albert's past his present and his future. So dug in like, you know, what was the, uh, who, who influences you, who influenced you? What, what books do you read? Um, what has you be the successful business person that I know you to be? And, um, what, you know, just kind of what actions have you taken in, in your, in your life to, to get where you are and some fun facts uh, in in his life, you know, I had no idea that he was such a cook. We go in, into that. I had no idea. Um, he graduated from San Diego State University, and while he was still in college, he was interning, and um, he got the the company that he worked for called Sight Lab to hire him on full time. So he was actually making a pretty decent salary as a senior in college, and. Um, which, you know, a lot of people that come out of college in debt, but Albert was, was working. And then he went out to bigger and better things, worked for a company called Double Click Performance, which in turn got bought out by Google. So Albert worked for Google for a, a, a bit, a little stint of his life. Um, we, he owns a couple companies now. We go in, into that, what has them successful and kind of the, the path that he's going professionally. Um, we get into a little bit of his past. He used to be a salsa dancer, and he was a competitive salsa dancer, um, which is really fun. I've, I've only seen him actually dance one time at a in a social setting, and he's good. The boy's got some step. I got to say that. So um, when we interviewed, when we did this interview, his wife was pregnant with their little girl. So current time, he's got a 15 month old girl, little baby girl. And, um, so they were expecting when we did this interview and now they have had their baby girl. She's, she's very healthy and very cute and everybody is doing very well. So without further ado, Oh, one more thing. So without Albert, without the influence of Albert in my life, I wouldn't be doing these podcasts with you guys. We, we made a bet. He actually bet me that um, to do a, a podcast and to have eight interviews in a podcast and have three of them out in, within a month. So published, um, out in the world, ready to be listened to and commented on and the whole deal, you know, the whole package of being in a podcast. And I actually didn't have that happen. But what I did find out is that I love podcasting and I love being with you guys. So much fun. I love it. I'm going to continue it. So without further ado, here is Albert. All right. Um, so the so welcome, Albert. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Um, and this picks up, this will pick up, you know, a uh, mouse fart. So you don't have to talk loud or anything like that. You know? Okay. So the first thing I, I always ask is for a sound check is what would you have for breakfast? For breakfast today, I had turkey, sausage with spinach, kale, onions and garlic, and two over medium eggs uh, on top. I was hoping there were some eggs in there. And a one-quarter slice of toast, a tiny bit of toast. Is there, is there any certain reason why it's only a quarter slice of toast? Is it just for a little little crunch because you're not, not allowed to have the, the toast? Or, I've, I've never been much of a, of a bread guy for sure and just yeah. a carb guy in general. Yeah. Uh, so since I cooked the eggs over medium, the intention of that was I wanted there to be like a nice yolky sauce in that paleo veggie mix. Yeah. And I wanted something to scoop up uh, yeah. that sauce on the bottom. So. A, a tiny little slice of bread did the trick perfectly. I love runny eggs over stuff. Yeah. <laughs> just in general. That sounds pretty awesome. Did you make it for the whole family or just yourself? I made it for me, uh, Omi, which is what we call Taryn's mom, my right. mom number two who lives with us, mm-hmm. uh, and Karis, our 15-month-old. Uh, everyone enjoyed it. Karis only ate 
probably about half of what I thought she would eat. Very flavorful, big meal. So yeah. she eats a lot of like oatmeal and simple foods. So she, she was probably, her palate was likely also overwhelmed by it. Yeah. Which explains why she didn't eat a ton of it. But she'll probably snack on it throughout the day. A little rich for her. Yeah, big flavors. Yeah. It's like over it's like over cooking a tomato sauce it won't go bad but it gets so robust that it's like overwhelming to eat is that a kid thing you know is that like uh, you know kids palates just aren't used to it I don't know yet I think so <laughs> yeah I think so and, and certainly cooks learn that too like there is such thing as mm. too good of a good thing uh, yeah like with French sauces everyone's like I want it to taste more cheesy or more buttery and you might think so for a bite or two but Eventually, it'll actually be. It's like too much salt. Like, there's such mm. thing as too much salt. Mm. There's such thing as too much even good flavor. That's interesting. It's not balanced on the rest of your palate. Yeah. Uh, how do you know about this? <laughs> <laughs> the robber did not have this question, <laughs> this slide of questioning in mind. I was like, really most interested. Longest, longest sound check ever. Uh, my family has a long background in food. My, mm. my, Dad worked in many restaurants, still loves to cook. It's probably his only activity now that he's dealing with a lot of health things. Still cooks, which is crazy. Yeah. Uh, and, a, and a guy who can't do much of anything, like walking across our home, will have him be a little short of breath. He can still cook enough food for 30 or 40 people. It might take him all day, but he could still do that. Really? And, uh, but, and he's, but he's never been in the in the business necessarily, but he just does it. Yes, he's worked in restaurants. Oh, okay, yeah. My sister is a trained Le Cordon Bleu. She's mm-hmm. a very high level trained chef, uh, and my mom also worked in a, in restaurants growing up. That's actually how my mom and dad met. My dad met my mom when she was working in her parents' restaurant, uh, and I just I love food. I love to cook. Mm-hmm. When I went to school. Uh, So I didn't learn how to cook like my sister did. My sister, who's seven years older than me, started cooking in high school. And I didn't start cooking until I moved out and went to college. Mm -hmm. And everyone's like, what the hell took you so long? Because everyone in my family loves to cook. Well, I I didn't have to. Like my sister, (laughs) my sister, my mom, and my dad all cooked a bunch for me. So I moved out and I had a meager budget. I remember the first apartment I rented in San Diego, my share of the rent was $387.50. That was 17 years ago. And I think my overall budget for the month was like $200 in terms of like gas and food and going out money. Like it was modest. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized, holy shit, I either am going to eat crap food or learn how to cook good food. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started to learn how to cook. Balling on a budget. Well, yeah. a budget. It is a lot. It could be a lot cheaper to make you know great meals instead of going out. Of, you know, going out for crappy meals. You know, you just gotta know how to shop and what, you know what you're looking for and stuff like that. I personally love to cook, but nothing super fancy. I just love to cook because I love to eat. So I'm like, okay, I'm hungry. I will. I'm not. I don't shy away from cooking stuff. But yeah, it just came from my mom going. All right, I'm tired of you asking what's to eat you mm-hmm. got to get in the kitchen start doing it yourself man like yeah. at, I don't know six or seven or something like that I started cooking oh wow yeah very little oh yeah man I mean I was like I gotta eat <laughs> Siri wasn't cutting it anymore you yeah. show me how to do eggs <laughs> that's awesome so I started cooking eggs I still love eggs huh. so, awesome so um, do you, since your dad still cooks do you still does he take over a lot of the a lot of cooking or do you get actually a chance to cook for the family I, I cook for the family the most out of everyone at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the reason is actually kind of lame. So for any any non-cooks out there, people who don't consider them cooks, the whole, I don't want to cook for you because you cook amazing, that's such a horseshit. It's the worst <laughs> thing ever. Because cooks love tasting how other people cook because our yeah. cooking tastes the same just because of how we manage temperature when we put something on the pan how much like the little details when we salt how much oil we use mm-hmm. like that's what makes a person's cooking taste like they're cooking mm-hmm. um, so dad cooks when we request that he cooks and it's just a sweet spot right because we'll be craving something mm-hmm. there's a Filipino dish called bidding here and it's like a porridge but it's made with coconut milk and you crust the outside of the rice so it's cr- like crunchy. Yeah. And then the inside's like this coconut milky, creamy rice like dish. It's so good. And I still can't cook it like he does to this day. So he'll cook when we request him to cook. Otherwise, I cook a lot. 
And then Taryn and Rhea, um, they cook for sure, but they cook probably similar to how you did when you were little, little. You know, they cook for sustenance. So they'll say, we're hungry, you need to eat. Let's cook. And then they'll cook what's there, like an egg or oatmeal or like a simple carb or starch or something like that. Yeah. I like to, you know, burn up some flesh. Yeah. Stuff like that. Some grilling, some barbecue. Oh, yeah. yeah I, love, I love grilling. It's, it's, it, you don't have to clean it up. Yeah. You throw it on there, it smells good. Yeah, it's the whole deal. It's like, you know, fire them apart in the end. It's also, uh, I love that. Is there, for those who are, are listening, I know for myself, what is the influences, like, you know, what was like uh, a cookbook or someone maybe you modeled yourself after or a certain, is there a certain type of food you prefer to cook or prefer a way to cook? Yeah. So my favorite foods to cook and yeah, I was going to draw a line between what I cook for others and what I cook for us at home. And then I was thinking about it and I don't, and I don't need to do that because it's the same. So my favorite foods to cook are the, like the ethnic and cultural comfort foods that, that other people ate. So like, for example, uh, I have some Salvadorian friends and they grew up eating pupusas. It's like a stuffed tortilla and that like does it grave injustice. Mm -hmm. Um, Or like, I I guess we could guess that maybe comfort food for Italians is like a specific kind of sauce, like a puttanesca sauce or maybe the comfort food for like a Colombian friend of mine is like a a sofrito, like a pollo sofrito. Mm -hmm. So my favorite things to cook are dishes that when I go into like Robert's house, like what's something you grew up just in loving eating was like kind of like a comfort food to you that your family cooked or someone in your life cooked? Cheesecake. Yeah, so it'd be like cheesecake, and you like your cheesecake a certain way. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, do you like your crust soft and moist or more like crunchy, crackery? Crunchy. Yeah. So crunchy, crackery. And do you yeah. like your cheesecake more gelatinous or more creamy? Creamy. Yeah, so that's a, those are distinct, right? Yeah. So I would eat it, and if I liked it, I would say, oh my God, it's delicious. Like, can you show me how to cook it or any tips you have? And I would work on recipes like that. Hmm. So I have a lot of recipes that are like, random cultures comfort food like the ones I named pollo sofrito I, we have a couple of great Italian recipes for a lemon chicken or a marinara sauce that I got from visiting friends homes mm-hmm. and asking their either my friends themselves or their parents like what's your comfort food and can you cook some for me and can I watch so those are my favorite things to cook awesome I, I had no idea <laughs> So yeah, this is, great. This, this is the best sound check ever. First of all, and then second of all, this is like Robert and I have never talked about this for sure. Never, so. yeah, and and it's surprising because I love to eat. So <laughs> this should be one of the. I'm going to ask this more often. You know, from people, hey, do you, do you cook? Because I love to eat. So we, you know, yeah, it, and I. I'm not afraid of cooking and I really like to cook, but I find myself, I never need to because my wife loves to cook and mm-hmm. I actually feel bad sometimes because she's, she's cooking, she's doing all the, all the cooking, but it's, it's, it's not a warranted bad, you know, she, it's not like, oh, feel bad because I'm cooking. She actually loves doing it. So we have a, a pretty much an agreement to, I see, you know, it's a loose agreement that she cooks and I clean the, the, the dishes. So yeah. I'm fine with that. Yeah. Um, so, um, another interesting, what I find interesting about you is you have, um, you have and had multiple businesses you've worked for, um, you know, tech companies that, you know, most people have heard of and stuff like that. You want me to say a little bit about that, um, about your, um, your education and like the, the, the fields you've come from and what you're doing now. Yeah. So after my college jobs working in restaurants, I graduated from San Diego State University with a Bachelor's of Arts in Communication, so just a worthless degree. What the the hell do you do with that? (laughs) And I, my situation was pretty cool. I worked for an interactive ad agency in La Jolla called SiteLab International. They later renamed themselves to SiteLab Interactive, and I worked for them for five and a half years. That's a long time for people in my generation to work get a lot of work in technology. So we did, we were an ad agency, so we did a lot of online marketing. And 
when I worked for them, it was pretty cool. I started as an intern my junior year of college at San Diego State, and then they actually made me a full-time offer when I was still a senior, which was cool. My last semester, I was getting paid a, a nice salary and still going to classes. So two of the days a week, it was Tuesdays and Thursdays, I wouldn't show up at the office until 10.30 a.m., which was really neat. Mm-hmm. So a random encouragement for kind of making those bold statements. It was my request that they take me on out of internship and, and full-time. Mm. Uh, and then I wanted to go big, so I went to the biggest company in the space, which at the time was DoubleClick Performix. They're an, an ad agency based out of Chicago, and Google bought us, which was huge. So I think they bought, they bought for in this, some, somewhere in the in the tens of millions for sure. It was a it was a big sale, and DoubleClick is still part of Google to this day. I got some Google paychecks, which was fun. I did a bunch of work at Google headquarters and traveled to the different Google campuses. And then I got the entrepreneurial bug, and I came home from a business trip to my roommate on the sofa, and he said, hey, let's open a tour company. And I said, I know nothing about running tour companies. And he said, well, you're a marketer, right? I said, yeah. He said, okay, what if I ran it, and could you just keep the phone ringing? And absolutely, that's what marketers do. So seven years later, here we are. We still own the same tour company. We have a location in La Jolla and downtown San Diego. And at this point, we've given over 17,000 tours. There's a unique way you give these tours. Yeah, so most of our tours are Segway tours, mm-hmm. those goofy two-wheel machines. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and we do walking tours. We're starting to go into e-bike tours. Uh, but of the 17,000, the, the vast majority of them have been Segway tours. That's pretty cool. There's all kinds of stuff that goes into doing a Segway tour around town, like you got to be in the street, you got to be on the sidewalk, uh, there's different stuff, right? I mean, like you're not always allowed on the sidewalk or always allowed on the street, right? Something like that? Well, actually, vice versa. So the reason why Segway tours work so well in, in California and 34 other states, 35 states total, is that they're legally in the same category as a wheelchair. Uh, so they're, they're a, a personal assistance... Uh, there's an official word for it, I forget. But it's basically like it's a personal transporter vehicle that's different from a bicycle. So a bike, you're not allowed to actually ride on the sidewalk. You're supposed to ride in the street or in the bike lane. Segways are not supposed to be in the street or in the bike lane. They're supposed to be on the sidewalk. Mm-hmm. So Which is why they're also such great tour vehicles, is we're able to go basically anywhere people are allowed to go. So instead of riding around on like a big, smoky smoggy double-decker tour bus looking at Balboa Park from afar, we're able to roll all up into the park and right through it. I mean, like a, like a wheelchair, you go inside, like wheelchair accessible places too? Yes. That is wild. I totally. No idea. Yeah. When hence, we, hence mall cop. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. And when we first got our fleet, my business partner, James, just he, uh, he loves being a heel. So he loves being that guy that is like really dry humored and uh, and, he, and he likes kind of trolling people. So especially in the early years, he would take a Segway everywhere, to the bank, to the grocery stores, and he would roll through the grocery store, the yeah. bank. <laughs> and, and he just loved when people are like, you're not allowed in here. And people, they'd throw up a fit and try to call security. And he's like, nope, you, I, I actually am exactly allowed in here. Yeah, yeah. Um, besides it being on a Segway, what makes that company different? What makes you guys different than other tour companies in San Diego? I'm sure there's a few of them. Yeah, so two things. One, we hire tour guides that are all adults, and they give a shit. Like, our tour guides are all not lifers, but they definitely would be up for being a tour guide for life if it worked for them Mm -hmm. uh, financially and time-wise and with their health and everything, because tour guides have to be up and about. Uh, So they are really passionate about giving their tours. Uh, and it's not it's not bad being a college kid working at a tour company. Like that's also an awesome thing. And we've just heard from other guests that a lot of other tour companies just have young kids there who don't necessarily have this huge passion for sharing our community. So we've been lucky like some of our best tour guides are people for whom money is not an issue. Uh, the best fits are like retired people from authority positions, like teachers, retired police, retired fire, because they often don't have to worry about making a ton of money anymore because they have their pensions. Mm-hmm. They have the authority to be able to like speak 
with confidence and assertiveness in front of a group, and they just kind of want something to do. Mm-hmm. That's pretty rad. So all of our tour guides tend to be of that ilk, number one. And number two, we're also very committed that our tours are really easy and safe. Uh, we've had zero accidents and zero claims ever since we've been in business, which is really, really unusual. The average claim rate for a Segway tour company, uh, we know this from our insurance company who insures 24 other companies, their average claim rate is 1.5 a year. We've had zero over seven years, which is pretty cool. Uh, well, uh, the first thing that popped into my mind was, i crash one of those games. <laughs> I'd, be the one, I'd be the one crash. Yeah. yeah. You said that um, you, got, you got the entrepreneurial bug. What had it that, um, you know, how'd you get the bug? What, what, was, the, what was the bug? What, what was the, was there an incident? There, was there something that you're like, okay, corporate world is not no longer for me, or what, what was it? Yeah, I was closing multi-million dollars for, for DoubleClick and Google, and they definitely compensated me handsomely for them, like no complaints there, and I wouldn't give those years back for anything. And I just wanted to put my hard work into earning more for myself rather than others. Like most of us have gone from a paycheck, you know, clocking in to entrepreneur, like I can do this on my own and, and make money for myself and my family and, you know, yeah. Um, not work for the man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, that's that's a dream. What, what was the what was your like big major influences? Whether it was a person or a book or a course or something like that in your in your life that you would say um, still influences you today. Specifically, with regards to my businesses or just in general. I think in general. Yeah. So the, my dad is a huge influence in my life. He's been one that like. He's just such a giver. Like he, like to this day, he pays, he pays. I think more than half the mortgage, even though he doesn't have to, and even though uh, on that household there are seven people living on it, he still and he insists to do so just because he can. Uh, and. He's always been really committed to my mom, where even through some tough years when we thought that they might go their separate ways, it was never like a conversation for him of, well, yeah, how would that look? How, like, how would that go for you? How would that go? It was, he, was, he, he was always like, no. And we're like, why no? Like, it's, so, it's rough or it's hard or look at what's going on. And he would say, no, that's, that's my wife. Mm. And that's all there is to it. It was just a not, like this is how it is because he says so. Not ever in a bad way. He's the most gentle human being I know, almost to a fault. But certainly strong in his convictions. Mm. And um, how's that impact your life now, being a father and a you know soon to be husband? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I uh, I get to look at. Taryn, who's my fiance, mother of, uh, of our two girls, and just know that, like, that's what a, for, like, we have a forever relationship. And having that is so great because I don't have to worry about something like divorce. I don't have to worry about, like, managing my life so that just in case something happened to me and Taryn, I have, like, this community or this access to certain people or these activities that I could fall back into. Like, I could focus today on what I'm up to for my daughters, for my family, for her, for me. And that's already way more than I can handle. So it really gives me the freedom to just... to. It gives me the freedom to be the man that I'm committed to being and not have to worry about, like, the what-ifs. Because mm-hmm. I don't... I don't live that. I don't live that life. Yeah, yeah. The what ifs are distracting. Anyways, distract from the big picture. I find the same thing. It's like it's freeing being in the relationship that I'm in. Yeah. Rad. What about um, like your structure of your life? I know you do a lot. Like you're up to a lot. You got a busy schedule. Is there anything in particular that you do? Like how you set up your day or. Um, you know, use anything in particular to organize your life, whether it's, you know, some sort of technology or anything like that? 
Yeah, I use a Google Calendar for my calendar. And then for structure, something that really works for me is it's so easy, especially running the businesses that I run now, to find that I don't have enough time to accomplish what I have to accomplish. And then that then will leak over to where I don't have enough time to spend at home. So what we actually just recently did, and I've been clamoring for this for a while, is we set up a schedule that has me promise that on Mondays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, I'm home before 6 p.m. And we have a 15-month-old baby girl. We have one that's being born any day now. And it takes something like for Taryn to manage that household. So she needs the support. So by me having that schedule, it was actually created that way so that her mom, who lives with us, kind of has the opposite schedule. And for her, Mondays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, Rhea will be home to help Taryn and the girls with whatever they need help with during the day. Uh, And then what that allows me to plan for is, okay, I know I need to leave this office no later than 5.20 to be sure I'm home before 6 p.m. as promised. Well, if that means I need to get up by 5 a.m. to get started with my day, then that's what I need to do. And that'll include whatever I need to do for my own well-being, like go for a run, meditate, even hang out with friends, do lunch, catch a super early happy hour. But now that that structure's in place, I know I can, I know what windows I have and I fill in whatever I need to so that it works. Mm -hmm. And if it, and uh, then that's just my promise. Do you, um, that, well, that's pretty awesome. I mean, a lot of people just can't even keep a damn promise. It's pretty, <laughs> pretty fabulous. Nice, you know, obviously it works. Um, how often do you, uh, do you meditate and, and, you know, take care of your well-being? What does, that, what does that look like, taking care of your well-being? Yeah, so that has not been, I've not been great at that the last four months. I've only been doing something active on average once a week, which is a huge breakdown because my sweet spot is that I do something active five or six days a week. Even if it's just like a short 20-minute break a sweat workout, like some beach body workout, like P90X or Insanity, or even a short run, ideally something longer, like playing ball or something. Um, so not great lately, and that's part of why I've been looking forward to us committing to some structure, so that instead of it being a conversation with the family of, hey, like I'm going to go to the beach and play volleyball with the guys, which is like, what the fuck, okay, so I guess I'm going to be taking care of our daughters all day. Like, we don't have to deal with that anymore. Yeah. Now it's, okay, well, I get done what I need to get done before 6 p.m. And if that includes that, then it's on me to schedule that in and know that I also get done at work, whatever it is I need to get done at work. Mm-hmm. So often it'll look like I need to wake up by 5.30 a.m. and really be out the door by 6.30 a.m. And, hey, I get to do all that still, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, well, it just sounds like the structure really works. Um, I, well, I know just because I, I, you know, I know you for, you know, a long time is, um, you used to dance. So, yeah. Yeah. To, to, uh, share with me a little bit about your, uh, your dancing experience and what you've accomplished doing that. Yeah. Super fun. So anyone who, man, if you want to meet people, just, sorry, this is random, but if you want to meet people, man, just go to a beginner salsa class. Cause that world is so fun. So fun. Like, anyone who feels like they... um, So for me, I I didn't do anything fraternity or related in college. Still partied my face off. And having the dance community is just a great social community where I could party my face off. And I dated a bunch in the community for better and for worse. Uh, And it was also a great structure for so I like structure so it was a great structure for being active after school because I competed as a dancer and it's not hard to compete as a dancer like there's a lot there's events at least every two or three weeks around the country which is a big commitment but certainly in any area there's an event at least every couple of months uh, where you could compete and I competed I loved what that provided for for my competitive spirit Mm -hmm as well as for just like having a reason to eat healthy and to be in really great shape. 
uh, and I have danced on stages all like New York and Chicago and Canada and San Francisco and Vegas multiple times. Uh, we did win a couple championships, so I won one local championship and one in Vegas, which was really fun. The Vegas one was that team's first victory, and we upset uh, the reigning victors from San Francisco, which was cool because we kind of came out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I remember something I've really gotten connected to through dance is how much, for me, like being prepared makes a difference. Mm-hmm. So if I'm if I go into a competition. And I knew that I put in the hours I needed to put in, which is, and I'm an over preparer. So for me, if, and I'm also not a gifted natural dancer, like it really took a lot of practice for me to get to where I got to. For me, if I know I put in every hour I needed to put in to feel prepared, if I walked into an event, sometimes events are small, like a couple hundred people. But then if I also walked into that event and it ended up being like massively bigger, like TV cameras and three or 4,000 people, I, f- I felt the same because I felt prepared. And I knew that what there was for me to do was just go out there and do what I was trained to do. And let, that's very much carried over to my work because if I really need to nail a presentation, then I know what will really give me the confidence to do that is to go over it ad nauseum. Like, 20 times but that works for me like I could be surprised so the reason why is uh, we went whenever we would have a new routine or choreography we would always practice it a bunch before performing it on stage because we wanted to make sure we had it really down pat so there was a new routine we had only ever performed it I think twice and we had it booked for a practice we called them warm ups we had a warm up uh, at a studio here in San Diego and we walk in and, and small class of like 20 is to the left and there's like a glass window and we can see in another classroom there's another small class of like 10 so we're like oh this is going to be just another super small performance we're performing in front of literally maybe 30 people like super small so we go into the bathroom we put our costumes on and we walk out and like suddenly there's an extra 20 or 30 people there, they're kind of buzzing though. They're all smiling and laughing and everyone's like just more giddy. Mm -hmm. Like, what's going on? So Mary Murphy, who for years was on, um, what's that show? It's Simon Simon Cowell's first show, the singing show. Oh, um, you got, not you got talent, but... um, Not America's Got Talent, the one before that. American Idol. American Idol, yeah. So Mary Murphy was like that. Ah! Like, that was Mary Murphy. Yeah, yeah. She was there. <laughs> and the receptionist told her, oh, yeah, we have, we have, a, we have a couple who's, who's showing us their salsa routine. Mm-hmm. So we walked into one of the tiny little ballrooms, and there were fucking, like, 80 people in there. <laughs> and 30 of them were Mary Murphy's troop. Like, Mary Murphy was sitting in the middle, and all of her people. And it's the worst I have ever performed. I was tight. I was missing steps. I was off beat. I couldn't even crack a smile at the end because I was so tight and tense. And ever since that moment, it just it just got me connected to the one. I should treat every show on stage with the respect that it, it deserves. Yeah. Uh, and secondly, like I was just unprepared. Yeah. Uh, and I blew it off as like, oh, we're just going to dance in front of some beginner salsa class. No big deal. And here comes Mary Murphy, who's been seen by hundreds of millions of people on TV as a dance critic and someone I look up to in the local dance community. Yeah, yeah, bomb that one. <laughs> I put, like, it was, at the end, it was even awkward. Like, we didn't even say to talk to her. It yeah. sure as hell didn't ask for feedback. Like, yeah. we're just like, well, well, we learned a lesson. We learned, we, we, we learned, we were like, learned a lesson, went straight to the car, wearing our costumes and everything. We're like, let's get out of here. It was great. It was such a good, it was such a good experience. <laughs> a failure that you learned from. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. My friends. And one of the things that we used to really talk about with, uh, with Mike was we would make fun of the fact that he's Egyptian mm-hmm. in, in just an endearing way that friends do. And oh, yeah, I know the endearing way friends do. <laughs> yes. Yes. And something that it was like, it lasted for a year And it was so annoying. But for a good year, especially, I think it was probably 
nine or ten years ago. So smartphones were maybe three or four years into into their coming around. So not ever not everyone even had an iPhone by then at that time. But if you left your phone out on the table, a fair game. Mm-hmm. And someone changed my Facebook born in city to Cairo, Egypt. And I just I you know the funny thing is Robert, I didn't notice for years. For years I didn't notice, which is why that was such a good prank, because like super subtle, it's not like posting something to my status that makes me look ridiculous. Yeah. No, like super subtle change. <laughs> And to this day, I actually don't know who did it, and I just haven't. And I just haven't changed it. Yeah. So, that's well, that's Cairo, Egypt. The, at least so. On, <laughs> yeah. So on, on Facebook, Albert is from Cairo, Egypt, and uh, you know, I mean, I, we have done way worse things than that. If you leave your computer open, you open yes. it up, and all of a sudden there's a screen full of odd pornography or something like yeah. that and it comes up you know and uh, we're just we're just spot I was in the, actually in the gym working in between classes I popped open my phone and, yes. and uh, there was porn on there and my boss was standing right behind yeah. me and he's like whoa so many- <laughs> guys- I'm like I don't know <laughs> like, yeah sure I was like no really I don't, yes. I don't know I can't get it it won't stop yeah yeah <laughs> like yeah sure um, so uh, um, you have a Segway um, tour company, and yeah. what else do you do, you do that I, I know you more for is the having uh, Airbnb? Yeah, so we property manage vacation rentals uh, that go on sites like Airbnb and VRBO, and that's actually been what I've been doing full-time for the past three years. Uh, the Segway tour company... I started to give the reins over to my business partner, especially the operational day-to-day, about two, two and a half years ago. And I did that more uh, with more structure for him in 16. So he's really taken over a lot of that. I still have my ownership share and take a small amount of compensation from that. But it's really been the vacation rentals that have been keeping me busy. Yeah, and I see you, and it's busy, man. And like, um, it, that's running a serious show from... Like you said, laundry to cleaning to booking to you know introducing people to the house. I mean, the whole whole deal is quite the production. Yeah, and you're for the most part a one man show, right? Yeah, yeah. We I, I manage for doing something north of six hundred pounds of laundry <laughs> a month just for the rentals because one of the rentals is uh, has ten beds, mm-hmm. big forty five hundred square foot home, so. Sometimes we'll have 16 to 24 guests staying there. And we give each guest a bath towel, hand towel, a washcloth, a pool towel. That's four towels per guest. And then multiply that by 20. And we host maybe one group a week there in addition to three other small rentals. So these are all properties that, uh, that my family owns. We don't have any outside clients right now. Uh, and likely don't really want any. We're just managing for these. And it's plenty to manage. Yeah. Between laundry and having cleaning teams available and making sure that there are backups to the cleaning teams because we can't ever not be ready for a guest to show up. The way we see it, uh, any guest that comes is like from the third world country. It's their one vacation every 10 years. They really saved up. San Diego's been their dream place to come check out. Like We really honor that guests come and, and that we want to deliver on a great experience for them. So it's a lot of freaking work, yeah. Yeah, I, I know there's, I'm sure, people are listening that are, you know, doing their day-to-day job, whatever, and have a, a thought of being an entrepreneur and, he, and hear about those like yourself have multiple businesses and the family. It's like, how can I do that? How, how, does that, how does that happen? Is it, you know, is it, oh, you're in a lucky position? I know it's not, you know. I'm just throwing stuff out there with, you know, what could be said. Oh, he's just lucky, you know, right time, right place, maybe born into money, all that kind of stuff. Like what, um, I mean, how do you, how do you do that? How do you, how does that all come about? I know none of that is, is true, but you know, I mean, that's what I get. I get a fair amount. Well, you're, you know, you're just lucky, you know, what, what are you going to do when your luck runs out? And you know, I have a few words to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I haven't found myself lucky at all, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was lucky that my wife asked me out, but, <laughs> but you know, like what's your experience around 
around that and what, what others who maybe aren't in your position who see that you run multiple businesses and you know I mean you're successful in that area yeah so I think overall it really just took me being stubborn hmm. and saying okay I'm going to try this tour company thing uh, and if I'm being honest, like neither are working as much as I even need them to because I'm getting a job in corporate America here in the next few months in all likelihood. And if not, it's because I'm going to go back to school to get a job in corporate America. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been over seven years since I started the companies. And with the tour company, it really just took being up for stepping into the unknown. At that time, I had never started any company. I didn't. I had my comm degree, but it was not an MBA. It didn't give me like a step by step do this, do that. Uh, we forgot things. Like we didn't realize we had to have workers comp. Mm -hmm. We didn't know that until year five. Not even like oh, it took a year or two. We didn't know that until year five. Um, and there's just not a lot of places that are like, this is how to structure and set up and have your small business be successful. There are certainly places for small parts of it, like for funding, for small business lending, or a class on like benefits for employees, or you, and you could read things online, but there's not one particularly good trusted source. So the tour company was really just a, a, a being at peace with that we're gonna mess this up, and it's just a matter of learning as we go. With the rentals, so being that they're real estate investments, I, I think something that really had that be possible for us, because we're not a wealthy family by any means, or else I wouldn't have to be getting a job, right? Uh, with real estate in particular, I was so surprised how many creative ways there were to buy homes. So there are things like FHA lending where if you qualify, I could only put down 5% on a home. So on one of our homes, we only put 5% down, uh, which is still a lot of money. That's $30,000 or so, but $30,000 and 5% down on a $600,000 San Diego home is much more in reach than putting down the traditional conventional 20% on a $600,000 home, which would be $120,000. It's very different than $30,000. So FHA lending made some of the homes possible and even getting more creative than that where we didn't even have to go to a lender for the big house because we had the seller carry our financing. And that's another thing that's available to probably at least one in 20 real estate transactions. The seller would be open to carrying financing themselves, which wouldn't require us to get a loan, at least not immediately. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's all makes me like makes my head spin and makes me want to do it you know like yeah. there's you know there's hope <laughs> yeah i want to do the same thing i want to you know we want um houses uh, uh real estate property and, and rental properties and stuff like that too yeah um so uh what's i mean what's next for you say so you want to um you're thinking about school and corporate back to corporate america like how does you know what's it i, I for me personally going to work for somebody else, it, it's not something that I ever want to do again. I consider myself a bad employee. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, coming from an employee, uh, I wouldn't say I was a stellar employee, and I think I, I, I paid the, the karma for that, having my own business and employees. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then, you know, not having employees and, and, you know, so forth. But so, share with me a little bit about that. Like, what are your thoughts? and what do you want to do and, and you know, what's that going to be like? Yeah, so I'm actually really excited to go back into corporate. Mm -hmm. I, I've really had the opportunity to run these businesses and to produce what I could produce for a long time now. For seven, seven years is a long time to go at it. And the interesting thing is, it's not like I'm closing down the companies and selling my share of the tour company. I'm keeping my share of the tour company. And the rentals, we have one, two, three, four. We have four right now. All four are going to still continue to run and operate. Mm -hmm. I'm just setting them up now such that they're running themselves hopefully at least 98% of the time, if not more. Yeah. Like the tour company does. Yeah. Like I do less than, I mean, easily less than 10 hours of work a month with the tour company. Mm -hmm. uh, and I then financially get less and James gets a lot more and that's, not, that's fair. Mm -hmm. 
and certainly the same with the rentals. Like I'm going to be hiring people, and I'm stoked because I'm also hiring some great people uh, to to help support those being successful and safe and secure. Um, so it'll cost some money, but that will really free me up to then be able to get a job and. It'll just be nice to walk into an office and not look around and say, shit, I, I, I have to pay the rent for this in a week. Or, oh no, this monitor is flickering. Is it going to break? Or, like my favorite thing with for entrepreneurs is, especially if you're opening up a, a location, and you just got to know as an entrepreneur that if, if I have a, a gym or a tour company retail location or an art gallery... Like if I had an important meeting or some guests coming to see my business that I'm proud of and you are out of toilet paper and I'm out of toilet paper and the restroom is a mess. Yeah. Well, guess who has to clean the restroom? Yeah. So I am looking forward to not having to worry about cleaning the restroom or vacuuming or any of that. So I'm looking forward to a, a decent, if not great paycheck certainly the opportunity to make some performance uh, bonuses and commissions and most importantly to have benefits and a clear path to retirement for me and my family yes having three or four properties certainly looks like a great path for retirement and i'm not going to bank on that like something at the least i think everyone can acknowledge there's a lot of uncertainty with our political climate at the least right and something that it's certainly connected me to is I want I am committed that my family be strong and independent so we're not going to have all of our eggs in the real estate basket mm-hmm. I'd like some 401k some IRA maybe some things even offshore uh, just so that I know that my families will be okay even if shit really hit the fan yeah really taken care of what well, what I hear is you're not shrinking at all you're actually expanding your your life so it's not like you're get, you know, um, chopping everything off and then starting something else, you're actually expanding your life. So yeah, so I can, yeah, I continue to be an entrepreneur. It just looks a little different. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's really rad. Is there what? What would you like um, everybody to know? If there's one or two things that you um, want people to to know, um, or um, like, if you could have something written in the in the sky, what would it? Hmm. What would it be? So if I could have something written in the sky that I would implore upon humanity, it would be find whatever it is that has you fulfill on what you say is important to you and just surround yourself with it. So that, it comes from the idea that like some of the world's most brilliant ideas are in cemeteries that people had these brilliant ideas and they never executed. So anytime someone says, man, I just really want this thing, it could be something big like starting your own company or it could be something relatively straightforward like I want to be faster or have a a smaller waistline. And if there's that stopping point of like, but it just isn't happening or I don't know how to get there, where there's something that will work for some people. Like for me, what is really effective is when I have... an accountability structure around me that's not just like, oh, yeah, like Robert, will you hold me accountable to that I wake up by 5.30 every morning? Well, like a text message, not going to work because I could fire off a text message in my sleep. Like what really I know would matter for me is if we have like a quick minute-long conversation and you get all up in my business and are like, are are you awake? Because I don't think, I'm not sure if you're awake, really. Mm. And I do that today like when I really need to get something done I go to my shared workspace and so just to share with everyone what it is for me that has me be in action because that's what that thing I wrote in the sky is is what is it that has me or anyone be in action is to be in an environment where I can be really open with like right now Eric Connie and Robert are in our office space And I could tell each one of those three people, today I need to work on finishing my forecasting for 2017. And I'll open up the spreadsheet and show you all, okay, I need this column, which reflects our target revenues for each home. I need this to have numbers in it. And then 
the three people between Robert, Connie, and Eric know that in three hours, if they look over and Albert's on Reddit or on Facebook or reading about the Niners, any one of you could ask me, like, hey, so, are you, are, like, how's the sheet going? And then at the end of the day, I open up that sheet and show the people, like, this is what happened or didn't happen, and then I deal with that. And for me, co-working like that is just what so works. And now I co-work probably every day. And that's what has me be in action. Otherwise, it's unlikely I would ever get that spreadsheet done. I agree. It definitely has me in action with others around me, keeping me accountable, but actually not even really having to say anything. Just me telling them, creating with them, this is what I need to do. Yeah. And just you being here and me telling you, it's like, you know, keep, keep your word. You totally. Know? Yeah. And it's different for us. Like, like yeah. what you just said, I co-work with you a bunch and I see you mow through your, bu- like, so we do bubbles. You could talk about that on another podcast or here later, but whenever we fill in something, you fill in a bubble, right? I see Robert, I see you fly through your bubbles. Like, I don't operate like that. Like for me, it really works when I tell Connie, got these three things done and I like celebrate for 30 seconds or I like show someone a slide that I just finished for a big presentation. Like that's how it works for me. Yeah. So Robert worked found what works for him. So I would write up on the sky to just find what it is that keeps you in action and, and then surround yourself with it. Yeah. If you had to put everything you own on your back, pack up your family, and um, be totally mobile by choice, where would you go? With my family? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. As in, in t- today, but all by choice, not have to, not like yeah. you got kicked out or anything like that. But you guys have all chose to go mobile. Yeah. Put everything on your back. Where would you go? Like for, no, so there's a, it, it's implied that it sounds like this is for a while because mm-hmm. we pe- we're packed up. We're mm-hmm. not just going on a, tr- on a little visit. Uh, that's a great question. My first answer was Kauai, but I wouldn't want to be there for more than a month or two. So where would I go? You know what's, you know what's, funny is I think I would actually I feel so boring but I would stay in San Diego I love San Diego mm-hmm. I would I would be up for living here with a lot less like something that I'm that we're creating already as a family is working our way to living minimally and even in like a tiny home mm-hmm. uh, and just kind of force ourselves to be out in San Diego and our communities here more than just at home so, I mean, I've been to New York, I've been to San Francisco. I haven't done a lot of international travel, so that's where my, like, if I said something, it'd be based on just the things I see online. Mm-hmm. So, I, I, like I, the idea of yeah, like, like around like, Europe or like, something. Exactly. And yeah. it's like, mm, and even what I've seen online, to tell you the truth, it doesn't look that amazing to me. Mm-hmm. So, I love that in San Diego we have these amazing communities of people that are just kick-ass dads and husbands and amazing athletes and brilliant people, scientists and just thinkers and coaches and philosophers and the nature and the sand on one side and just all the sunshine. I, I would be up for living, for living minimally here and just really spending the time to discover more of ourselves and our community. Mm-hmm. What, um, it's like, what, grounds you, what gets you back to like hitting a reset button if you spending quality time with my daughter and specifically time where I don't have like this thing in the back of my head where I'm super behind on like a communication that needs to go out or on a project like once I'm clear enough that I could really just hang out with her and play that's the best yeah. and then looking at myself like solo uh, meditating like I, I love to meditate I don't do it enough I should I should put an, an action group together around meditating but uh, meditating like not even long like my sweet spot for meditation is 15 to 18 minutes mm-hmm. is, I found works really well for me how'd you get into that a 
uh, a gal that I dated long ago uh, was just one of those uh, a very mindful person did lots of meditation she did the that crazy ass retreat in Encinitas where you or wherever not Encinitas Escondido where you you're silent for 10 days or whatever like she would do that yearly like huge in the meditation and she asked me to just try it so she gave me the most like pop Justin Bieber version of meditation she she says just try the Deepak Oprah the Deepak Chopra and Oprah 21 day challenge which is such a basic like simple meditation and to this day it's my favorite course like they have I think 20 different programs now like abundance and perfect health and loving relationships they're all 21 day sequences and I've tried I tried the one you suggested the guy the dude the app headspace headspace (laughs) I've tried so many and there's nothing wrong against them at all but just the, the Deepak Chopra and Oprah combination and their timing just works great for me so I like the Deepak Oprah I like how you said that the Deepak Oprah <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah That's really cool well cool man well if there's anybody who would like to reach out to you get a hold of you or anything like that where can you be reached if you want to be reached yeah well certainly email me um, absolutely anything like a community that I have really come to embrace are uh, our families because we have our family lives on one small little household like I mean it's a big house but it's a small plot of land I think the, the plot's like 6,000 square foot and we have a 2,000 square foot house on that and we live with seven people it's a lot we're soon to be eight and whether it's for anything business related which that's a layup for me like I'm happy to connect people with anyone that might make a difference for their careers or their business but also for the unusual things like not a lot of friends families that you want to look a certain way and they're not there yet happy to share about any of that and emailing me at texasalbert at gmail.com is easiest. So Texas, like the big state, Albert, like my first name, T-E-X-A-S-A-L-B-E-R-T at gmail.com. Just reach out. Cool. I'll put that in the show notes also. And um, uh, Texas is actually where you're born, right? Not uh, Egypt. <laughs> no, I actually wasn't born in Texas either. I, uh, I represent Texas a lot because when I was out there for, uh, for high school and starting college. So I was only there for seven years. And it was a very influential seven years. So I say that a lot of how I am I got from Texas. Uh, maybe just that I, I do like a nice cold beer or some scotch. Uh, so maybe mostly just that. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. All right, man. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. And um, like I said, I'll put um, the things mentioned and your information in the show notes. And um, until next time, we're out. Good night. Drop. Good, good day. Good Dr- breakfast. Drop the yeah. <laughs> drop the mic. <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, before you guys leave, I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank Albert for being on the show. Um, if you would be so kind, if you like the show or you want to make a comment on the on the show, you can go to my website, which is robertbud.net forward slash podcast. Or you can rate the show on iTunes. I would love that. And you can listen to these on also on Stitcher. And uh, rate away. Um, without your ratings, I don't know how I'm doing, actually. So so please please do so. Please rate the show. And if you have any comments, I get back to everybody. Also, if you would like to receive a very short email from me about some of the you know weird stuff that um, I'm digging up in, inside of my life, like what books am I reading, uh, what supplements am I taking, um, what am I doing as a evening uh, process before I go to bed. Uh, it's always changing. I'm always experimenting with my life. And uh, if you'd like to receive one of those emails with all that goodies, all those good information in there, go to my website, robertbud.net, and sign up for the newsletter that would be really great and you'll get the very next one uh damn i sound like tim ferris man i listen to that guy a lot and that sounded just like him so um i apologize kind of not really anyways um so 
Thank you all once again for listening. And until next time, peace out.